Show number 13, John. How are you feeling about it? I'm feeling pretty unlucky. Oh, wow. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm actually feeling very good. I mean, I'm feeling day. really lucky that we made it this far. I, mean, I know, you right? thought with you as a co-host we'd get... No, I'm just kidding. I don't, just kidding. I don't like you, <laughs> for the record. Let's get that out of the way. No, it's, uh, it's a beautiful day out here in uh, North Wales, PA. Uh, we're seated in Montgomery County right now in Pennsylvania. We are. Nice. In the United yeah. States of America. Right. Got a human map here. Mm -hmm. um, we're at the borders at 801 Bethlehem Pike. North Wales, Pennsylvania, where we are every Thursday from 7 to 8 to uh, put on this beautiful show, Transitions, for you. And we have a great lineup tonight. We, we certainly do. We have uh, Melissa, our lifestyle and uh, travel correspondent, will have aspiring actress Shoshana Katz on. Dan Schmidt, our current events correspondent, will be on for a very special uh, New York City mosque roundtable. We have uh, up-and-coming designer Maria McDevitt, also my roommate. So it's going to be an interesting interview, and uh, I don't know if we're going to talk about her line or you know whose turn is to clean the bathroom, but we'll get somewhere with that. Or both, maybe. Or both. Who knows? Uh, Janine's doing a segment too with the nightlife and what's on tap. She's going to be talking about the Lemonheads, the Candles, and Ozfest. Uh, quite a quite a, uh, a combo there. Quite the combo. Uh, well, let's jump right into it. Okay. Um, we're going to go to Melissa with Shoshana Katz. Good evening, everyone. I'm Melissa Leon, your lifestyle and travel correspondent. Tonight on Philly's Lifestyle and Travel Trends, I'm here with Shoshana Katz, an aspiring actress um, here to discuss her, discuss her lifestyle and transitions as an actress and who has just one more year left at the University of the Arts. Welcome, Shana, to our show. Hi, thank you. Thank you very much. So, tell us, what plays have you done so far? Um, well, in college, I've done two. Um, my first show was my first semester as a sophomore, and that was Tin Types. It's kind of a musical review, not so much a structured show, and that had a lot of um, vaudeville aspects to it, which is something really different, really what interesting. What is that? Vaudeville? vaudeville um, it's a lot of slapstick comedy, okay. old school. Um, it's before there was traditional theater. They had vaudeville first, and um, like, hello, my baby, hello, my darling, like stuff, oh, stuff like fun. that. It, it was a <laughs> lot of fun. It was definitely something really interesting um, to do because it's not a traditional piece and it's not a play. It's not a musical. There's really not a lot of structure to it. So it was it was hard to take on, especially as a sophomore. So it was really fun. And then uh, the most recent thing that I've done is On Her Toes. It's an older musical. Okay. Yeah, we can go. Um, and that was at the Miriam stage this past March on Broad Street in Center City, Philadelphia. Wow. Yeah, I've been to the Miriam stage. Yeah. That's a great theater. Yeah, they have a lot of a lot things of come theater. in. Yeah, a lot of um, touring companies come in and use the stage. It's owned by the University of the Arts, but it's a pretty expensive space to use, so we only do one show there a year, um, and that's normally in the spring semester and a lot of touring companies come in and rent the space from us, so that's pretty neat to be able to be on that great of a stage. Right, yeah, I imagine so. Yeah. So you've obviously done plays with a paying audience. How did it feel to transition at that moment from being on stage for friends and family to one with a paying audience? Um, I mean, there isn't necessarily much of a transition because even when you're in high school, people pay for tickets to come see you. Um, I never really feel comfortable <laughs> just singing in front of family or like just a small group of people because you know people are listening to you and are looking right at you. Where when you have this huge massive audience, it's just, I don't wanna say you can't tell that they're listening to you because you know that they are, but the faces aren't as clear and you get a lot less nervous and you, <laughs> like people aren't staring directly at you, at least you can't really see. And it, right. in a more intimate setting, it's slightly more intimidating. Yeah, yeah, our audience is pretty intense yeah. we're not too nervous. No, it's okay. I'm, I'm not singing and dancing on stage right now, so that's fine. What were some of your influences in terms of like cooking and food? Um, you know, for me, I, I work with few ingredients. So my influence is really um, produce. It's, it's ingredients themselves. So for me uh, to do, for example, the, the Jersey tomato brunch this morning completely made sense because Jersey is producing some of the best produce. I mean, I, I think this this festival is unique in the sense that we get to really show off produce because we are in New Jersey and we've got blueberries that are incredible, the best in the country. Tomatoes, Jersey tomatoes, the most famous. Sweet, succulent, incredible. 
but you don't have to be a good chef to work with these ingredients. White corn, and it knocks my socks off. Um, Jersey peaches even surprised me. I mean, incredible. And I'm from the South. These are Southern ingredients, wow. I thought. Wow, I'm impressing you. You're impressing me, blowing my mind. I mean, sorry, Southerners. <laughs> Jersey kick no. are behind <laughs> in some tomatoes. Um, but it's been such an extraordinary event because celebrating the local produce, um, getting to really interact with people here has been such a, such a unique part of this event. I loved it. Great. Thank you so much for taking yeah. the time out. We're so happy you were here. Yeah, thank you. Sorry about my voice. Yeah, yeah, and enjoy the rest of your time in Atlantic you. City. How can you not joy, enjoy Atlantic City? That's what we like to hear. Uh, we're going to go over to Dan now, who's going to introduce a very controversial segment here on Transitions about the New York City Ground Zero Mosque. Take it away, Dan. All right, thanks, John. Well, the Ground Zero Mosque, also known as the Cordoba House, or now Park 51, is the Islamic Community Center located two blocks from the World Trade Center. The 13-story building is supposed to have a fitness center, culinary school, food court, a 500-person auditorium, and, of course, prayer, uh, prayer space for up to 2,000 people. Behind the project is Imam Faisal Abdul Rauf, who made controversial comments in a 60 Minutes interview shortly after 9-11. And this has sparked one of the biggest debates in recent history, which has even the families of the 9-11 victims split. Some believe that the Cordoba House has every right to build their Islamic Center at its proposed location, while others believe that it is a slap in the face to the thousands who died in the terrorist attacks. So I guess my question to you guys is, do you think the Center should be built in its current location? I mean, I, I in reading about this topic, I and I wish I could remember the exact um, person who said this quote, but sure, this group has the right to build this mosque. I mean, we live in America, we have a right to celebrate whatever religion we want and to celebrate it wherever we want, but just because it's right doesn't make it the right thing to do. And that was the quote, and I wish I had the name for it. But. it there, there's an article here by uh, Charles Krauthammer who talks about uh, you can build it wherever you want, but not here. Uh, it's kind of like, um, I don't know, I want to compare it to driving. That's not a right, it's a privilege. You, know, you can drive, you have this privilege, but you got to drive on the road. You, you can't go drive you know, off into the grass or try and hit people or something like that. Uh, maybe it's a bad analogy, but I mean, <laughs> yeah. I don't. I don't think it should be built there. I, I recognize uh, the Muslims' right to build a mosque, just wherever they want, but not there. We're talking at the site of the greatest mass murder in U.S. history. I mean, this was this was nine years ago, and sort of kind of faded from memory a little bit from the from the pop, uh, from the popular cultural lexicon, if you will. But it's still something that is very fresh to a lot of people. And to place a mosque right next to it, right there, um, I think that was. What do you say? That was kind of like the uh, Japanese government building a cultural center next to a Pearl Harbor, you know, or uh, a Disney World Civil War ex uh, ex uh, amusement park. I'm sorry, next to a Gettysburg or something like that. So it's just not there anywhere else, but not there. And and my question is, why there? I mean, where does this come from? That this is the optimum. This is the place. Ground Zero. It's happening. This is where we're putting our mosque. I don't understand. You know, why? why that would even become a topic to any reasonable human being um, with any bit of sensitivity. What, why would, you know? Well, I think some of the arguments are saying that uh, they wish to have it there just to improve uh, Western and Middle East Muslim relations. This is what the, uh, uh, what's his name, Ralph, is his first name? Ralph, um, he said yeah. that he wants to send a message opposite to that of the terrorist attacks through peaceful interaction between um, people of different faith, even the word Cordoba, what they claim it's um, comes from, I believe, 8th century, and it was a time when Muslims and Jews and Christians mm -hmm. all lived peacefully. It, Islam, in its most purest sense, essential sense, is a very peaceful religion. Uh, the terrorist attacks were carried out by, keep this in mind, a very small you know, faction of radical Islam claiming that their uh, Muslim beliefs were behind their actions which a lot of Muslims just don't agree with. Uh, I think it's still too fresh in a lot of people's minds to say, you know, uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> we kind of killed everybody. Uh, a lot of people stating that, you know, they had our religion to their backs and then they kind of went in and did that. And there's still a lot of turmoil in the Middle East, but we're gonna put this cultural center right here. It's just a little too fresh. It's just still, 
it's still there, you know, it's still, it's still in the memory of, of everybody that was there to witness the attacks, so. I think it's the exact opposite. I think they should build it there. I think they should have no problems building it there. I think that they have every absolute right, and I'm not doing this just because I have two people saying no across from me from the table. This is my genuine belief. If we are the greatest country, as you know, everyone likes to tote we are, then we can't just, you know, give up everything that we held true for, you know, 200 plus years in the declaration saying, oh, we think everything's great, but just not you. Like this whole country was built up on the idea that the bad guy, you know, the one, the unpopular guy has a voice. I mean, going back to like McCarthyism and stuff like that, communist newspapers were allowed to be published. You know, these guys should be allowed to build a mosque wherever the hell they, they please. You know, it's gonna piss some people off, but if you build an anti-abortion clinic next to an, you know, a place for like Planned Parenthood, people are gonna get pissed off. Do, do, do those people not have the right to do that, to put that there? They have absolutely every right, and anyone trying to impede them on that is, you know, a hypocrite, especially if they're a public figure who swore to uphold the uh, Constitution. Well, I don't think it's, I mean, I've already stated, yes, they have the right, that, that's true. Everyone in this country has the right to do what they what they please, and Obama even, um, in, in an article about him, had agreed that, yes, they have the right to put this there. But it goes back to what I said before, like, just because we have the rights to do these things and, and people are still gonna hold an opinion on it and I, it's still hurting a lot of families. Um, I personally think it's insensitive. I don't care who, what group would be doing this. That territory is very sacred, a very difficult place for a lot of people. We're taking a break from the bands this week and instead bringing you a new wardrobe. Maria McDevitt, a May 2010 graduate of Philadelphia University's fashion design program is here with us tonight. She is the perfect fit for our show as she is at the pinnacle of a major transition in her life. The transition from student designer to real world designer. And as if that weren't enough, she can also be found every weekday morning at 6 a.m. on Boathouse Row, training to transition from a college rower to an elite rower. Her days are fixed around rowing, sewing her own clothing line, and interning with a designer for the music industry. Welcome, Maria. I right now want to focus on design, which obviously is what I went to school for, and has been coming at me pretty fast since graduation. So I balance it out by rowing for, like still staying competitive, but um, more for me than for a team, and, and using that to balance out my life with all fashion design. <laughs> Does the fashion design take up a lot of your time, Maria? Um, no, just like this much. <laughs> just, just a very tiny just a bit. a tiny bit. A very tiny bit. So the rest of the time is between uh, making dinner for Callie every night. Yes. She demands it. <laughs> every uh, night. Swansea's microwave, I believe you like. <laughs> and growing full time, oh. essentially. Yes. It's an interesting uh, parallel between you and Shoshana, who we had on earlier, who really kind of, you both have to dedicate a very large portion of your lives to your passion. Exactly. Whether it be rowing or acting, or in this case also uh, fashion designing, is that how one would say that? Sure, you could say designing fashion. fashion. <laughs> I like that. Fashioning. Fashioning. Fashion engineering. Nice. <laughs> I mean, well, let's get a quick summary exactly of what you're doing as a designer right now. Well, right now I currently um, I'm working on my own line, which is basically a spin-off of my second collection I made senior year. It's more um, a transition transition of it from spring to fall. And um, along with that, I'm helping, uh, well, I'm interning for a designer who is working also not only on his new line, but his new accessories invention called Vamps, which is uh, an accessory for your feet, essentially. So if you have a messed up pair of black heels that you love and want to jazz it up, you know, you wear Vamps. So it's really exciting because I'm doing a ton of work for him and then at the same time, you know, every morning, every night, I'm working on my own project. So. so what about the uh, messed up black heels? I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> exactly. So we're not adverse to getting swag, so if you want to bring some, some free <laughs> stuff in, that's cool. If you want to uh, knit me a comfy blanket or something. I could, I have Snuggie. Yes. I could knit a Snuggie. <laughs> a giant Snuggie for myself. 